Hello and welcome everyone. So this is part two of my price gouging uh, lecture. And so now I'm going to kind of move us ahead and think about Zwolinski and uh, in, the, in the paper that Zelensky's got kind of analyzing or providing some compelling rationale behind the standard mainstream economics response to anti-price gouging laws. So the interesting thing here, Matt Zelensky's philosopher and uh, studied studied economics. Um, I think he might have a PhD minor in econ, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, uh, from University of Arizona. Might be maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, definitely philosopher. Definitely has kind of written a lot of interesting things pertaining to um, applications of economics. And there's some really interesting things for us to gain here. Now you might agree, you might disagree with Zelensky's reasoning. And my goal is to kind of think really carefully about analyzing the economic reasoning. So. Right. If you disagree with Zelensky, even or if you agree with Zelensky, so think carefully about why and think about what are the relevant assumptions, what are the relevant economic assumptions that are underlying what you might take issue with or what you might agree with, right? Because the way that we're framing, the way that we're thinking about the world, and the way that we're thinking about how markets actually work is really important here. In particular, do you think that markets adjust quickly or slowly? Do you think demand is elastic or inelastic? These are some really important questions to ask. Um, what do you think happens to the supply curve and the demand curve in the wake of a disaster? And, uh, and so on and so forth. Do you, do you believe that willingness to pay and ability to pay are highly correlated or do you, be, do you believe that they might become decoupled, especially in the wake of a disaster? Like all of those things are interesting to bring up in this context. And you'll kind of want to think about those. All right, so paper begins with this anecdote about four men from Goldsboro that bought 500 bags of ice for $1.50 per bag to sell in Raleigh for $12 in the aftermath of a hurricane. This is pretty much what people think of when they're reflecting on price gouging, right? Turns out North Carolina prohibits it, uh, but even if it's not illegal, we generally consider this behavior to be somewhat exploitative and immoral. Zelensky argues actually uh, the common moral condemnation of price gouging is largely mistaken. And the argument kind of takes kind of, there's kind of three, uh, three things to talk about here. So firstly, uh, Zelensky is going to argue against the idea that against the against the moral justification for laws prohibiting price gouging, actually arguing that they create more harm than good, um, argues against the idea that price gouging is morally impermissible behavior, even if it uh, even if it ought not be illegal. Um, and then price gouging reflects poorly on the moral character of those who engage in it, even if the act itself is not morally impermissible. Zwinski is going to argue the standard casing of price, cases of price gouging provide actually great benefit to those in need, and the standard cases also tend to lack the morally objectionable features often ascribed to them, such as coercion and exploitation. And attempts to prohibit the practice harms individuals who are already vulnerable and can least afford to bear further harm. All right, so like if we agree... Um, if we agree that there's no coercion and no exploitation, Zelensky's in a particular example, we're, we're then going to reflect on whether or not we believe uh, these cases of price gouging is actually causing harm or benefit to those in most need. Um, one of the reasons why Zelensky will argue that the practice of price gouging benefits those or at least more benefits than harms those who are most desperate need is because of the allocation issue that if there's a shortage and if the price doesn't adjust we get a really inefficient allocation mechanism and the cost of that could be most highly borne by those in most need and so that's kind of uh, that's kind of an aspect of the argument all right so this is an exercise in non-ideal theory kind of realizing we don't have um kind of the ideal arrangement of things there's kind of we're in like a second best or even third best world. And we want to think about like, what's the best that we can do given the real world circumstances, right? So we might object to inequality that pervades the distribution of wealth and social services in, the, in this country. Um, we might worry that price gouging exploits or exacerbates that uh, inequality. So such people might consider the real problem uh, to the fundamental issue uh, the real problem to be the fundamental issue of an unjust basic structure. And Zelensky's saying, well, okay, so if the basic structure is unjust, we still actually have to decide how individuals ought to act. In particular, 
We need policies to be formulated within this real world context. We have to decide what to do about price gouging here and now um, in our sort of non-ideal world. All right. So in terms of like the legal structure, well, there's no present federal anti-gouging legisl legislation, um, though there is a bill on gasoline. Around 34 states have laws against price gouging with a definition involving about three elements. So typically, a state of emergency has to be declared. Typically, anti-price gouging laws are, are going to be held on uh, goods judged as necessities. And typically, there's a price ceiling involved. So there'd be some kind of a limit on the max price that could be charged. And the idea would be to outlaw unreasonable, excessive, unconscionable price increases, typically defined in percentages. So it might be like you'd outlaw a 10% a increase over whatever was the prevailing price for the last couple of weeks or something like that in the wake of the disaster. Um, so Zelensky uh, defines price gouging as a practice in which the prices on certain kinds of nece necessary items are raised in the wake of an emergency to what appears to be unfair or exploitatively high levels. Definition does not say price gouging involves deception, misinformation, or the use of force against consumers. Like these are all things we could probably immediately ag agree are bad and should be, and should be um, avoided. Swinsky argues that anti-gouging laws are unjustified whatever one might think about the moral status of price gouging itself. Like even if you believe that price gouging is bad, we shouldn't have a law against it, right? So even if price gouging is morally reprehensible, there's good reason not to prohibit it because, well, the laws can be severely flawed. They take into account um, the, the, they fail to take into account the increased cost sellers face as a result of the same disaster that has placed customers in difficulty. And that's actually kind of like a key sort of compelling aspect to go into and to explore is to think of the ways in which the costs have risen for sellers. Remember, in the, in the previous paper here, we were talking about the things that would justify a price increase. And we said, well, if there's, a, if there's a shift in the demand curve, that alone didn't justify an increase in price. But if there's a change in costs, then that did. If cost rose, that would justify an increase in increase in price. Well, in the circumstances that are surrounding a natural disaster and creating these circumstances for increases in prices, presumably, whereas there's like customers in, in dire need and in wanting these particular products, therefore leading to an increase in demand, there's also an increase in cost for sellers. And interestingly, or so, so argues Linsky, it's not clear why the merchant should be forced to absorb the increased cost in order to benefit their customers. Right? We might plausibly think of society as a whole should bear some responsibility for protecting its members in times of a crisis, but the whole responsibility shouldn't just fall on one class of person, such as the merchants. Such laws prevent sellers from recovering cost presence in a perverse incentive structure. They punish those who sell at an increased price, but not those who, not, who decide not to sell at all. So this is interesting and really important, right? If your costs rise, and if you want to sell these items in the wake of this disaster at a high enough price to recover those costs, you could run afoul of these anti-price gouging laws. However, if your costs have risen and you realize you can't raise your price, therefore you don't participate in the market, and whatever is this inventory, inventory goes unallocated, then, um, then the law is not saying anything about, uh, about those circumstances. right? So not those who decide not to sell at all. So why should there be no account made for the increased risk faced by the merchant remaining open for business during times of disaster? Right? I mean, certainly the very same circumstances that make it uh, risky and dangerous for consumers also makes it risky and dangerous for workers and for the firm itself. Laws also fail to consider the various opportunity costs that a merchant faces rather than shifting their capital to other less dangerous and more profitable markets. Right? I mean, so actually you could, to the extent that it's possible to leave the area, you could get such you could get such a perverse incentive structure that you could have merchants sending generators and sending water away from the disaster. I'm not saying that this has actually happened. Um, the public relations outcry would be would be enormous, but you could have a circumstance where, you know, hey, look, if there's this major disruption to business in this market, and you've got a store like a home improvement store or a grocery store kind of like right on the edge of the affected area. 
Um, and you have the ability to reallocate those goods to a place where you're going to be able to do business as usual. Maybe you would. I don't know. Um, so from an economic perspective, opportunity costs and costs imposed by risks can be just as burdensome on a seller as standard monetary costs, right? If, if your costs to, to continue to operate in this particular location are rising, but you're unable to raise prices to compensate for that rise in price, maybe you'd sell these goods elsewhere. And the point, the point is just, okay, so if you, uh, if, if, so if you disagree that this is, this is uh, like a realistic depiction of what could happen, now think carefully about what your assumptions are and what the economic model you're thinking of is, is looking like. Um, and it you know, quite possibly could be that your analysis is, is correct. We want to think really carefully about what, what must be true uh, for what I've just now said to be incorrect. Um, okay, so... The main reason why such laws are morally unjustified is that they prohibit mutually beneficial exchange in a way that makes those who are already vulnerable even worse off. Even if the price is exceptionally high, the fact that they are willing to pay shows nevertheless they value the good more than the money they're giving up to get it. Their willingness to pay the higher price reflects the increased need, not some type of mistake or irrationality, right? The fact that now somebody's willing to pay a lot of money for a bag of ice is signaling that they value that bag of ice pretty heavily. Right now, okay. So if you if you want to push back on this part, one of the actually interesting things to explore is: Do we believe willingness to pay and ability to pay are highly correlated, um, and, or do we, you know, do we believe that do we believe that the circumstances within which these consumers are choosing are non-coercive? Right. So some other interesting lines of reasoning to explore, and that's something good to kind of bring out um, in like a in in um, you know one of the weekly papers or something like that. All right, so that's so that is that's interesting, and it's interesting to explore uh, the fact that the people who are willing to pay high prices, right? So when those individuals were selling ice bags from Goldsboro and, and Raleigh, and they're selling them for twelve dollars instead of a dollar forty, and people were paying twelve dollars for it, uh, so Zwinski's arguing those the consumers who were willing to pay twelve dollars weren't making a mistake and weren't being irrational. They actually valued the ice bag at twelve dollars or more. And that's what the fact that they are willing to pay that price is reflecting. Uh, so another another line of reasoning that's interesting is saying, well, maybe customers are not benefiting enough, right? We've got this massive increase in demand, and consumers, like thinking back to this previous paper, have their reference point for what the price should be for ice or whatever is the case. Now my demand is increased, so my potential consumer surplus is increased, and maybe merchants have a moral duty to sell the needed goods at something less than the new market clearing price. Maybe they have a moral duty to sell to maintain whatever was the pr preceding uh, uh, reference point, the prior price. This is interesting. Like This is a good time to stop and to think. What do what do merchants, what do sellers, what 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 is morally required of those holding goods who are looking to sell them? What are, what's morally required of them? Is there a moral obligation to participate in the market in the first place? Is there a moral obligation to participate in the market at a particular price? What is that particular price? I mean, I don't have the answers to these questions. These are things to, these are things kind of to reflect on, and this is interesting. And the, one of the one of the problems with like doing this lecture in this format is like. When we can do this in the class, people have a wide variety, wide range of views on price gouging. We have we have some who are going to take a very standard sort of economic uh, perspective and say that price gouging is just fine, it's just supply and demand, and others will take sort of a a, a, a much different view and say, well, it's really immoral and and or um, you know taking advantage of consumers and, and or it's not really how markets work and so on and so forth. And usually we can get a pretty lively discussion. So I want to kind of raise some of these questions now and I want you to think about them on your own. All right, so maybe merchants would be exploiting their customers in the sense by price gouging. Swinsky argues that even if customers are wrongly exploited, it still doesn't follow that anti-price gouging laws are warranted. While this exploitation sets back the interests of those exploited, prohibitions on price gouging sets them back further. Here's why. So when the prices are below the market clearing price, there's excess demand, there's a shortage. When can this happen? So the market clearing price is referring to what's the new equilibrium? What's the equilibrium after the disaster? And if we maintain the price lower and the price should be higher, now you've got a shortage at the original price. The quantity demanded has risen, um, uh, is artificially high at that low price because the demand has increased. So if you know you draw the, you could draw the graph really quickly, draw it 
standard X for supply and demand, and then draw your rightward shift to demand. I don't know if I can do this the right way from my, because I'm backwards in my screen, but <laughs> draw your rightward shift to demand, and then look and see where your new demand crosses the old equilibrium price, and that's gonna be your new quantity demanded. It's way bigger than the new quantity supplied. All right, so uh, this means that customers are willing to buy the goods at higher prices are made wor worse off because they're not able to get the good. Because the goods are necessary, there's a, a special need for them, right? For health and well-being. So they're probably actually not being able to get the good is probably actually making them significantly worse off. Uh, and the argument is that if prices were allowed to adjust, then those who would want the goods the most would be able to get them. The other story is that if the price was allowed to adjust higher, you might get in goods from other areas, right? So like the fellows from Goldsboro who are bringing in who are going to bring in ice bags to alleviate to alleviate the shortage, right? So there's kind of think about think about when there's a shortage, when a disaster strikes and there's a shortage of ice or there's shortage of generators, or shortage of water, bottled water, whatever is the case. How do we have to get rid of the shortage? Well, there's two ways you can get rid of a shortage. One is you can reduce the quantity demanded, and the other is you can increase the quantity supplied. Now you can increase the quantity supplied two ways. One, you can raise the price so the quantity supplied rises by the law of supply. Two, you could increase the entire supply. You get sort of a rightward shift to the supply curve that'll increase the quantity supplied at each and every price. What the second story requires is for people to bring in goods from other parts, unaffected parts of the world or country or whatever. And the problem is those individuals would probably need a reason to be able to divert goods from other areas, right? So like, you know, if a disaster strikes and an area needs ice bags and there's ice bags sitting 200 miles away in another city or water or whatever is the case, there's got to be some reason to bring those ice bags and bring that water to the place of need. Now, some people might do it just for charity, um, absolutely, or there might be charities that will buy up and, and bring the goods, but there's costs involved. And if there's not enough donations or if there's not enough charity to be able to make this happen, the only other way to really get those goods from one place to another is to get either the existing merchants to acquire those goods, which is going to be costly, and then sell at a higher price, or to get entrepreneurs to bring the goods from the other area in. Uh, in anti-price gouging laws eliminates both of those last two stories. So exploitation might be argued to show lack of respect for the personhood of those exploited. But laws against price gouging both manifest and encourage a similar or greater lack of expect, as argues Zelensky. So both merchants and consumers, by preventing them uh, from making autonomous choice to enter into the economic ex uh, exchanges, right? Both, both for consumers and, and merchants, uh, we show a lack of respect for them by virtue of not allowing them to enter this voluntary exchange, right? They encourage a lack of respect for buyers by making it more likely their needs will be neglected by those in a position to help them. Why? Well, it's a sort of like lack of incentive to be able to bring goods in. Now, there's some interesting things, so maybe you disagree with this. So one of the stories would be, okay, I don't actually believe that the goods are going to, in service, are going to come in. I believe that maybe there's high transaction costs and you're not actually going to funnel generators from 200 miles away into the affected areas. Or maybe it's impossible to get... Uh, to, to to get in over impassable roads or something like that. Like if you believe, if those are the stories, if, if those are the assumptions you've got and, and you want to sort of reinforce that economic story, that's an interesting way to sort of uh, counter argument these points. But, but anyway, so that's interesting. Um, Anti-gouging laws create shortages, not just in a literal sense where there's excess demand, it also happens in a broader sense where others who could have supplied those goods choose not to. Right? It's not that we run out of ice or generators or sandbags in the wake of the disaster. It's that we run out of them in a particular area and then have to decide whether or not to funnel in those goods from other parts of the country. Laws that prohibit the reaping of high profits lead many individuals who would have done something to instead do nothing. I mean, so when I was in Pittsburgh, I was teaching at Carnegie Mellon and uh, in Pitt, visiting a, a visiting scholar at Pitt. And there was there's some like disaster with like a spill in northern West Virginia, uh, kind of is like south of where I was in Pittsburgh. And I considered like I was looking around as going around a Giant Eagle, uh, the grocery store, and there's all kinds of water. And I was thinking, wow, I could bring a lot of bottled water down to this affected region, and that would help a lot of people. 
But then I was thinking about it. Firstly, like I'd have to rent a truck. It would take me the entire weekend, which I wanted to work on, you know, teaching and economics and, and do work. And so I had a pretty high opportunity cost of my time. And I was like, to make this worthwhile, I mean, I'm not going to be able to sell the water for the same price that I'm selling it at. And I calculated out like there is no way to be able to do that, not at a loss and also not run afoul of the anti-price gouging law. So I ended up like not doing it. The only way I would have been able to do it is completely as a charitable effort. But like, I, who, I, who, what individual person has the resources to be able to, you know, to be able to donate that much? Um, I would have liked to have been able to, but I simply wouldn't have, uh, couldn't afford it. And so, I ended up not doing anything to uh, anything to help. And, and you know, of course, there's like you know Red Cross and other sort of organizations that we end up deferring to. But if it was not for these uh, anti-price gouging laws, you know, people might have like if it, if I wasn't if I wasn't worried about legal repercussions I might have done it as sort of an interesting well you know some sort of an act of charity but then also as an interesting um, way to sort of experience this economic transaction in a way that would make this lecture way better right so anyway so disaster victims uh, needs are not exploited they're also not satisfied their needs are simply ignored this is when there's when there's anti-price gouging laws Disaster victims' uh, needs are not exploited. They're also not satisfied. They're just ignored. So then against the permissibility of uh, gouging, uh, coercion. So one might argue that price gouging is coercive, but most cases of price gouging have three features that actually undermine the concerns about coercion. First, buyers appear to consent to the exchange, right? Like if, you're, if you pull up a U-Haul and you are unloading ice bags and people are coming up in the parking lot buying from you, it seems like the buyers are consenting to the exchange. Also, most cases don't involve deceit, a lack of information or irrationality on behalf of buyers. Like they see the ice bags, they tell them what the price is going to be. They say, okay, I'll buy it or no, I won't. So the exchange is voluntary. Third, the harm that threatens to befall the victim seems not to be caused by the price gouger, but by the disaster, right? The harm was caused by this bad circumstance that now the price gouger is actually, yeah, they're benefiting from, but they're also doing something to help. So relative to the baseline of no exchange, the price gouger's proposal actually stands to improve the welfare of the buyer, right? The buyer is in a bad circumstance, like they're in this disaster and they have no water and they have no ice bags. And now here's the price gouger that's going to sell them expensive water or ice bags. And if they make that trade, well, they're better off, at least if they did the trade voluntarily. All right, so the core concern is that it's unfair for sellers to take advantage of buyers' vulnerability in order to derive disproportionate benefit themselves, even if buyers are benefiting from the exchange as well. And this is interesting. So there's an incoherence in our thinking about what morality requires us in terms of aiding those in distress. Like on the one hand, to the extent to which we hold price gougers are guilty of mutually beneficial exploitation, we hold they're acting wrongly if their actions bring some benefit to disaster, even if their actions bring some benefit to disaster victims. On the other hand, most of us do absolutely nothing to relieve, relieve the suffering of most disaster victims, and we generally do not view ourselves as having acted wrongly or in failing to provide this benefit, or at least not as wrongly as price gougers, right? Um, in, so in my town, I run by... Uh, I run by a charity. It has a sign up where they're collecting donations for victims of the flood in Kentucky, which I ha had otherwise been unaware of and definitely hadn't. The, I've been running by the sign for months. They haven't changed it. Presumably, they've al already made their donation. But the, but the point is, like, I did nothing. I didn't help them, and nor did I help people in, um, in, in West Virginia when I lived in Pittsburgh, and nor have I done anything to help uh, recent hurricane victims. And actually, I haven't done a whole lot of everything, anything. I've been kind of the quintessential super selfish um, economist. And I bet actually kind of a lot of people are too, right? So that's, I mean, that's not entirely true. So my donations go through, um, go through Kiva. Um, but that's kind of, that's a, that's a separate story. There's a presentation about an economist that came to give this, give a talk about charitable donations and teams uh, through Kiva.org. Uh, it was experimental econ paper. And so then I was like, oh, I should, this is something I should get involved in. So anyway, um, all right. So price is an allocative efficiency in light of, uh, in light of, in favor of price gouging. So well-functioning markets tend to allocate resources towards their most valued uses. Those who value a good more uh, might be willing to pay a higher price for it than those who value less. I mean, to, at least to the extent that we believe willingness to pay 
and ability to pay are highly correlated. If everyone bids for an item in proportion to the value it holds, each item goes to the person who values it the most, subject to the assumption I just mentioned. Suppose prices don't adjust freely. Now there's no way to determine the allocation of scarce resources using prices. The most urgent needs might go unmet precisely because the same resources were sold at a price too low to exclude customers whose need was not urgent. And this is like my story about airline tickets, right? So airline tickets are higher right before the departure and they're lower if you buy many months in advance. And what I like doing is looking to see, is there a cheap ticket from Detroit to Phoenix? Because I like being able to escape Michigan in the winters and do some trail running wearing shorts in Arizona and then stop at In-N-Out Burger. And if I can ever find a flight for super cheap, I'd like to do it, but you can almost never do that because the immediate departures tend to be pretty expensive. Uh, so it's good because I don't buy the ticket to go to Phoenix for 100 or $200 um, because I would, and then I would use it for trail running. Instead, I don't buy that ticket because it's not 100 or $200, it's $800. And then the person who needs to go for like an urgent family need or something along those lines um, is able to buy that ticket instead. And so that's kind of the story, that's kind of the story reflected here. Uh, so scarcity is ubiquitous in markets and decision-making. In the wake of a disaster, it's especially prominent. Without electricity for refrigerators, lots of people have lots of different uses for, um, for ice. Some are trivial. Maybe somebody wants to keep their beer cold. Others are more serious. Maybe a diabetic wants to have ice to keep their insulin safe. Um, but there's not enough ice for all potential uses. So the high price helps ration whatever is the, the scarce resource, ice in this case, towards the more valuable uses. So um, in the case of price gouging, higher prices charged for ordinary goods signal both consumers and suppliers. Suppliers to increase the quantity supplied and buyers to avoid buying it for frivolous uses. Interesting. So according to charges filed by Florida State Attorney General after Hurricane Charlie, one hotel in West Palm Beach charged three individuals a rate of over $100 per night for a room that was more than double their advertised rate of $50 per night. Attorney General says families putting their lives back together should not have to worry about price gouging. And Zulinski argues, well, this $100 price might be precisely what made that room still be available for these three, for the, for the three people they're able to, for the people they're able to buy it, right? The higher prices did more than increase the profits of hotels, signaled consumers to economize and help many families. As prices increase, people look for other ways to satisfy their needs, right? If you could just camp out, if you had a tent, or if you could go to relatives or whatever, maybe you did that, and then we, this left the hotels for those with no other options. Well, the increase in price does not literally increase the supply of hotels. It increases the available supply as a result of economizing behavior by deflecting whatever is the remaining scarce resources away from frivolous uses. It also signals in more direct ways. If ice can be bought at $1.70 per bag in Goldsboro and sold for $12 in Raleigh, this tells people that Raleigh needs the ice and there's substantial profit to be made getting it there. So the four discussed at the beginning probably were not motivated by altruism. Hard to know, I don't know. But they did something to alleviate the shortage that Raleigh was facing. Had they not been arrested for price gouging, others who heard about their profits presumably would have followed. And if enough people done this, the price would have fallen to $1.70, right? The sort of the arbitrage story. While it's true that market actors in the state of emergency will not have access to perfect information, this shows the outcomes will fall short of the theoretical ideal of this at most shows that outcomes fall short of the theoretical ideal of perfect competition. It doesn't show that the competitive forces are doing no significant work. Remember, Vernon Smith and then others demonstrated with experiments, markets can achieve equilibrium or near equilibrium outcomes even when none of the actors in the markets have perfect information or are acting rationally. Right? That's presumably why these four individuals charged only $12 per bag. Why did they not charge $40 per bag or $100 per bag? Well, it's because they realized $40 or $100 was more than the market would bear. The market would bear $12. That's why they set the price there. So this suggests that they're actually responding to market forces in a way that then was undermined when they were, uh, when they were arrested. Um, anyway, so there's some interesting things to think about here. You, you may agree, you may disagree with a lot of what is in this paper. And like I said, what I want you to do is kind of reflect on it, think carefully about what are the aspects that you agree on 
And what are the aspects that you disagree with? Now, there's kind of two ways to reinforce this. One, through ethical and moral reasoning. Okay, that's good. And then the other way is thinking in terms of reinforcing the economic reasoning. What assumptions do you believe are true to characterize this, th these circumstances? Um, and then, you know, w how do you think these markets would actually work? What do you think is going to be the most realistic model to be able to think about markets under a price gouging case? Especially, think about some of these recent examples, you know, during pandemic and, and so on and so forth. There's some really interesting examples of, of price gouging beyond the ones that I've got here. Um, what about Uber? Do we consider Uber to be engaging in price gouging with their surge pricing? It's interesting. So think carefully about what we mean by price gouging. Think about the relevant assumptions and think about what's what the cost and benefit is of price gouging, anti-price gouging laws. Think about what the cost, who bears those costs. Think about what the gains are, who bears those gains. And then think carefully about kind of some of these implications. It's, it's interesting. At, at the very least, hopefully it gives you something kind of interesting to reflect on here. And like I said, I wish we were able to have like the full sort of discussion that this usually leads to us just a super lively discussion. So I feel bad that we're not able to have that. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, this, this collection of videos, and I'll see you next time.